All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for coming out today uh, for this lecture. My name is Patrick Deneen. I am a professor of uh, political science uh, and uh, the David A. Potenziani uh, Memorial uh, Chair of Constitutional Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm really delighted uh, to be able to, to bring to campus today Carlo Lancelotti, uh, whose name uh, came, I became first aware of as the translator of two works of Augusto del Noce. I first read about Del Noche in, uh, in passing, and he seemed somewhat of interest to me, but because he wasn't translated into English, he was, some, he was sort of a terra incognito, uh, to use a different language, uh, someone that I was interested in but uh, unable to read. And so it was uh, with great gratitude uh, to uh, Prof Professor Lancelotti, who is a professor of mathematics uh, and on the faculty of physics. Uh, at, the, at the College of Staten Island and at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So this is not his main line of work, you could say, translating the work of a 20th century Italian philosopher. So I per was personally extremely grateful when I saw that these, uh, these two works had been, uh, two books by uh, Del Noce had been translated. Uh, the two books that, um, that Professor uh, Lancelotti has translated are entitled The Age of Secularization, and the crisis of modernity. The second of these was translated in 2014, the first of these more recently in 2017. Uh, Del Noce uh, lived during much of the 20th century from 1910 to 1989. And uh, one of the ways that uh, Professor Lancelotti describes Del Noce is, is that he wrote in some ways a philosophical history of the 20th century. Uh, and as People who, some of you who have lived through the 20th century, maybe a little bit older, and those of you who know something of the 20th century, it was uh, among the most traumatic centuries in the history of mankind, uh, but has ushered in an age uh, of some evident or apparent peace and prosperity, but a kind of deep spiritual malaise, and a kind, as we know today, a profound sense of political dislocation and instability. And the striking thing about Del Noche is that by delving into the rich philosophical tradition of thinkers like Hegel, Marx, Comte, uh, and a number of thinkers from an earlier era, as well as many contemporary thinkers, that he, I think, perhaps arguably more than any other thinker of the 20th century, was able to uh, essentially predict, in a very prophetic way, the, the kind of political agonies that we're experiencing now in the 21st century. Uh, the rise of a technocratic elite, increasingly separated from and divided from uh, the rest of the population, a, a culture of hedonism centered around consumption and consumerism, the centrality of the sexual revolution as the political project of the most uh, advanced and vanguard part of the society, and a corresponding rise of new forms of social control that's related to that advance, and even arguably a kind of new totalitarianism and correspondingly, the, the decline of religious faith and even seemingly the possibility of religious faith as a possibility in this aborning 21st century. All of this is remarkably present in this work of this mid 20th century thinker, Augusto Del Noce. So we're very grateful. I am personally very, very grateful to have with us today someone who, whose writings on not only translations of Del Noce, but whose writings on Del Noce make him to my mind, the leading interpreter of Del Noce in our time, and the, perhaps arguably by extension, the leading interpreter of the travails of our time. So please join me in welcoming Professor Carlo Lancelotti. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Denin for the invitation. Uh, so uh, my job is to try to give a 50 minutes quick introduction to Del Noce. Now, this is difficult because the Noce wrote about many, many things. It was sometimes obscure, I think usually very profound, but uh, there is not you know, one formula or one concept. He really talked about many different things. One could talk about the Noce as a critic of totalitarianism. You could talk about the Noce's ideas about the meaning of modernity. You talk about his writing on the sexual revolution. There are many things one could talk about. What I try to do, I'll, I'll try to talk about what I think is the thing you care about the most, which is what um, Patrick was talking about. Uh, to try to have a philosophical grasp of what moved people in the 20th century, what kind of philosophy, what kind of logic drove the history of the last century. 
Uh, even this is still a very broad topic, of course, to cover in a short time. And when I tried to organize my ideas, I came up with four or five different aspects one could attack this question from different sides. Uh, and so I kind of wrote them out, and uh, there is some of them are slightly heterogeneous, but I hopefully they will come together in some way. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to read this thing. Um, I'll try to read it fast enough not to put you to sleep, but slow enough that it is understandable, I hope. The thing that where I will start from is what also Patrick was talking about, about the fact that uh, Del Noggio was interested in philosophical history. So I'm going to explain this concept. Then I will move on, and I will try to put this in context of his experience as a young man in Italy, and generally European history between, say, 1930 and 1968. And from there, I will extrapolate and try to give his understanding of what happened. And finally, I will try to discuss what was his position, politically speaking. OK, so let me read this thing. As I mentioned in my introduction to the crisis of modernity, Augusto del Noce liked to summarize his understanding of the task and vocation of the philosopher by quoting a sentence by Hegel, the great German philosopher, from a book by Hegel called The Elements of the Philosophy of Right. Hegel said, philosophy is its own time apprehended in thought. For Hegel, who was an idealist, if you know what that means, this sentence was a profession of historicism. Historicism means the idea that we are all children of our time. So what we think is determined by our time. We cannot think beyond our time, right? So that's what it meant to him. Philosophy is what we can think about our time. For the Noche, instead, the same sentence, philosophy is its own time apprehended in thought, was a sort of moral imperative, or at least a deeply felt existential challenge, something he felt personally. To be a philosopher means to think our age, to comprehend the historical political world in which we are called to live. Right? I mean, it's, to be an intelligent human being, you have to try to understand the world in which you are. Unlike Hegel, Del Noce thought that such comprehension of the world is ultimately possible in light of eternal metaphysical and religious truth. Del Noce, besides being a Catholic, was kind of a classical philosopher in the line of Plato, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, and that kind of crowd. Uh, so he believed that there are eternal metaphysical and religious truth, but this truth have to do with history because in all their actions, human beings, we, cannot help taking a stance, implicit or explicit, about the ultimate meaning of their existence. The notion was coming that everything people do, deep down, is motivated by what they understand themselves the narrative they have about their own life, okay? What they think their place in the universe and the meaning of their life is about. The Noche also thought that, however, those eternal truths have to be discovered anew by each generation, by going to the depth of each generation's unique historical predicament. You know, sometimes people talk about metaphysics like Aquinas, like uh, Aristotle, or some kind of timeless philosophy, something that is done once and for all. Aquinas wrote it down, you have the summa, it's done. The summa is finished, right? So the Noche thought that even if Aquinas did it in the 12th century, each of us has to do it again to really learn, right? And so I want to, write, uh, to read a quote from his uh, first book, The Problem of Atheism. He states the following standard. It's a little obscure, but listen to this. Thinking in relation to the present historical context does not mean denying the eternity of metaphysical problems but recognizing this eternity in its true sense because it is necessary that we unburden metaphysical thought of the immobilization in formulas that make it liable to look like the alienated image of a certain historical situation. Okay? Everything can become formulaic. It is in the course of the personal process of solving the metaphysical problem that I recognize my thesis as the explication of a virtuality, virtual means a virtual possibility, of an affirmation that was already made in the past, that was made by Thomas or whoever. It is precisely in this explication of a virtuality that the metaphysical thesis becomes evident to me, breaking free from the always contingent form it had taken in its historical formulations. Rather than following from a hidden rejection of eternity, 
The recognition of the historical context is motivated by the need not to confuse the eternal and time. So what the notion is saying is that truth may be eternal, but we are not eternal, right? Uh, we cannot make the thoughts of the great philosophers really our own unless, in a sense, we rediscover them by thinking through our own experience. In that pro now it's me. In that process, we will not only encounter again the great metaphysical affirmations of the past, but we will also find new virtualities of those affirmations, meaning new aspects, new implications that our predecessors did not see because they were not facing the same questions that history makes us face. Truth is eternal and infinite, but we are historical and finite. And we must necessarily approach the truth starting from our own circumstances. Okay? So the notion is trying to avoid two mistakes. Well, one mistake is to say that truth is relative, that every age has its truth and there is no truth. That's one mistake. But the other mistake is that to say that the truth was found once and for all by somebody else and now we are done, right? No, because we live in a different time and we have to rediscover the same truth from the angle of our own experience. Now, this double movement whereby the historical context is understood in light of the metaphysical ideas and metaphysical truths are regained by delving into history, this double movement is probably the most characteristic feature of the Noche's work. Okay? The Noche keeps going back and forth between history and philosophy. He uses philosophy to read history, and he uses history to re-understand philosophy. As a philosopher, he is unsystematic, not in the sense that his thought lacks internal consistency, consistency, but in the sense that he feels no compulsion to formulate his philosophy explicitly as a system. As a historian of ideas, is primarily concerned with ideal causality, it means causation by ideas, meaning with the inexorable logic that leads from one idea to another and forces people to face the often unintended, conse unintended consequence consequences of their metaphysical postulates. The Noche studies philosophy almost exclusively through history and studies history almost exclusively through philosophy in a broad, not necessarily academic sense. He wants to understand history by understanding the ideas, the ideals, the worldviews that move people and societies. This is both his peculiarity and his greatest strength. It was also the source of a somewhat disconcerting prophetic ability he had to predict the ultimate outcomes of long-term trends that are still coming to fruition now, almost three decades after his death. He died in 1889. And the Noche in the early 60s predicted, for instance, that Marxists would kind of fail. Or he predicted, uh, well, if you want to read the book, he predicted in 1970 that people would introduce gay marriage. Uh, he, had all, he has all these predictions, not because he was a kind of a wizard, but because he was very logical in following the logic of ideas. And he said, if you start from this, you will get there. Okay, so this is kind of his strength. I should add, that to the Noche, the study of ideal causality is especially necessary in order to understand the history, not in general, but of the 20th century in particular. The 20th century was philosophical in a very specific sense, in as much as Western culture during that century kept going back to the great philosophies of history of the 19th century, like Hegel, Marx, Comte, and kept trying to put them into practice. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the birth of Marie Ten, the great Catholic philosopher, Del Noce said the following, talking about the 20th century. I believe that the most adequate formula to describe our century's history is the one that sees, it, sees in it the transition into practice of the conceptions that in the 19th century had presented themselves as philosophy of history. This is clear about Marxism and communism. Because if you think of it, the history of the 20th century was marked by the Leninist attempt to go back to Marx. But should be no less clear, in terms of the dependence on positivist philosophy of history, about the Western idea of radical modernization through science and technology, which from a Christian perspective is at least equally disastrous. And what one observes is that the result of both has been the advent of nihilism prophesied by the greatest foe of the philosophy of history, Nietzsche. Okay, so he says not only the history of communism in the 20th century was an attempt to implement Marxism from the 19th century, 
but also the Western response to Marxism after World War II, the technocratic society, you know, the, the faith in science, was an attempt to rediscover Comte, Saint-Simon, Herbert Spencer. Okay? So the 20th century was the century that tried to put in practice all the theories of the 19th century. So this was the first, the first, part, the first aspect I wanted to touch, this idea of doing philosophy through history and history through philosophy. Now, next section is contemporary history was not by any means the only focus of Del Noche scholarship. He started his career as a specialist in early modern French philosophy, especially Descartes and Malebranche, and he specialized in the relation between Cartesianism and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. He later studied a variety of 18th and 19th century French and Italian authors, and his writings display an impressive knowledge of classical German philosophy. Nonetheless, there is no doubt that the deepest and most enduring concern that runs through all his work is how to understand the history of the 20th century. This was a reflection, I think, of his own experience as a young man. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit of biographical context for the notion. For people today, it's not impossible, I think it's incorrect, but it's not impossible to look back at the 1930s and 40s and think that the totalitarian regimes of that period were historical dead ends ugly parenthetical statements that have been left behind by the ongoing progress of civilization. This is kind of the more progressive, optimistic view. In fact, people of my generation, I'm in my early 50s and younger, have often been taught that fascism and Nazis, they were reactionary, fundamentally irrational, anti-modern phenomena driven by the resentments of social groups that could not accept the transformations of modernity and tried in vain to go back to an authoritarian and imaginary past. Have you heard that kind of story? And that therefore, if you believe this, those years were a terribly tragic historical period that came to a bloody but relatively quick conclusion, but did not mark a permanent irreversible crisis of civilization. Okay, so the kind of, a, it's not hard to think today that things went they went bad for a while, it was a big disaster, lots of people died, but then things got back in track, okay, on track. Things got back on track, and now we are just fine. But to the young Del Noce, things looked very differently. He was born in 1910, and as a teenager, he, wist, he witnessed the wave of violence that accompanied the rise of power of, Mus of Benito Mussolini. He was, as you know, the Italian fascist dictator. He graduated from the University of Turin in 1932, as Adolf Hitler was preparing to murder his way to the top of the German state. By the time the Spanish Civil War was over in 1938, and Del Noce was 28, it seemed very likely that fascism would be the dominant political force in Europe for many years to come, possibly for the rest of his life. This prospect drove him and many of his generation to a position that he later described as the temptation of Gnostic dualism. The Gnostics were an ancient heresy, and they believed that, there is a, that the world is under the domain of the devil, and that God left the world. And the only way to go to God is to destroy the world, because the world is under the domain of the devil, right? Think if you have this possibility. So these people, when fashion was triumphant, had this temptation. By that, it meant the thought that the world is under the power of evil, and the only possible response is to morally detach oneself and stand in silent condemnation of politics ruled by inhuman violence. Paradoxically, a few years later, when the war started and the Soviet Union presented itself as one of the great anti-fascist powers, that same Gnostic temptation pushed Del Noce and many of his generation towards embracing communism. As has been pointed out by many authors, notably the political philosopher Vogelin, Marxism has some distinctively Gnostic characteristics. Like the ancient Gnostics, it dreams of a new eon, a new world, that will replace the present utterly corrupt world. After a cosmic transformation, which he calls the revolution, predicted and facilitated by the Illuminati, by the enlightened elite, which is the, the leadership of the Communist Party. Faced with Lenin's challenge, Lenin's challenge, Lenin said, either socialism or barbarism. In the early 40s, Del Noce himself was attracted to the so-called Catholic Communist Movement, which after the war would be an extremely influential in Italian politics. I could explain to you what that means, but it would take a while. There was people who thought that in order to be a good Catholic, you have to enter into an alliance with Marxism against fascism. Okay? That was the idea of the Catholic Communist Movement, essentially. 
But what rang an alarm bell for him, however, was the fact that the communist, was the fact that communism himself seemed not to escape, but actually to be a part of the explosion of violence that was convulsing European civilization. At the end of the day, communism was not a solution to the violence, was part of the violence. In Italy, when the communists took over several regions after the retreat of the German army in 1944, 45, they immediately unleashed a bloody civil war, murdering by the thousands, not only former fascists, but also monarchists and Catholics, and whomever might stand in the way of a communist regime after the war. After that, as has been observed by an Italian scholar, Borghese, Del Noce thought, sorry, Del Noce's thought was marked for the rest of his life by the moral and religious question of violence. Del Noce understood that in the face of evil, the only alternative to Alternative explanation to the Gnostic myth. The Gnostic myth is again the myth that there is the world is under the, the, the domain of the devil and the, the, the good world will come after in the future, after the revolution. The only alternative he understood was the theological doctrine of original sin, whose rejection he later identified historically with the beginning of modern rationalism in the 17th century. Del Noce has this idea, this is another famous topic, that the beginning of rationalism with Descartes uh, at the core, there is a rejection of the notion of original sin. Anyway, this realization coincided for Del Noce to his return to Catholicism, which he then embraced for the rest of his life. So, but Del Noce's Catholicism really has this, has this deep political significance to him, you know, to, uh, to affirm, to reject the Gnostic temptation. Okay? For, for him, the return to Catholicism was the rejection of Gnosticism. After the war, Communists, communists did not come to power in Italy or in France or in Western Europe, but in both countries, Marxists became culturally hegemonic. This is probably forgotten by many people today, but after the war, for a long time, Marxist culture was hegemonic both in France and in Italy. Its dominance came at the expense of the forms of historicist liberalism that had been prevalent before the war. In Italy, in particular, this transition to the Marxist hegemony has often been described as the transition from Croce to Gramsci. These two guys, you may or may not know who they were. Benedetto Croce had been the leading light of Italian anti-fascist culture under Mussolini in the name of a neo-Hegelian form of liberalism that meant to bring Italy into the mainstream of European secular modernity. So Croce was a liberal, but he was not a liberal in the American sense, okay? very, different time, very, very different kind of liberalism. He was a Hegelian historicist uh, liberalism. Antonio Gramsci, as you probably know, had been the founder and the main theoretician of the Italian Communist Party. Before dying in 1937, he had theorized a Western form of Marxism that emphasized the role of cultural institutions in capitalist societies and the need for communists to establish its own cultural hegemony in order to take power in advanced industrial countries. Industrial countries. So what, what, what Gramsci thought that you know, in, in places like Italy or France, you could not have the revolution like in Russia, because they were kind of industrial, advanced, uh, complicated places. So you have to take over the institution. You have to establish a hegemony. There is a famous sentence by Gramsci, the long march to the institutions. Have you heard of that? Okay, that was Gramsci. Now, in the quarter of a century that followed the end of the war, Italian communists did successfully pursue Gramsci's strategy, of Gramsci's strategy of cultural hegemony, systematically establishing their dominance in the universities, in the public school system, in publishing houses, in the press, in the judiciary. You know, uh, I'm Italian. When I was young, half of my professors were Marxists. It was very normal that all the communist party would send people in the public high school. For I remember when I took my the final exam at the end of high school, I, I, I brought philosophy for my oral examination, and I, uh, I knew everything about Kant and Hegel and Kant, and, uh, and the guy said, okay, okay, but tell me about the transition from Marx to Lenin. Uh, uh, okay. okay, why? Because he was a good Marxist Italian professor, like most professors were Marxists, okay? So, there was, so the Gramscian hegemony worked in some sense, okay? They did take over the culture. Um, also in the judiciary, okay? I mean, uh, there were all the, these communist judges. You know, when people talk about Berlusconi, Berlusconi did many wrong things. But all the people who tried to indict him, they hated him for political reasons. That's also true, okay? Because the, 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 the Italian Communist Party pursued a systematic process of training people to be judges, okay? And this was a realization of the Gramsci's theory of hegemony. 
Also thanks to these efforts, the Italian Communist Party grew to be the largest in Western Europe and the second largest Italian party, kept out of government only by a grand coalition of all the non-communist parties and by the fact that Italy was in NATO and NATO would not be happy if the communists had gone to government. However, the Gramscian hegemony did not bring Italian society any closer to the communist dream that Soviet power had been able to do in Eastern Europe. On the contrary, the post war years were a time of frantic economic expansion in which a traditional Italian culture was swept away by the irresistible forces of capitalist modernity. Rampant consumerism, chaotic urbanization, individualism, technological progress, sexual permissivism, the usual menu. Del Noce observed that not only was Marxism, Marxism utterly impotent to fight these trends, but in fact it facilitated them. This is something that really caught his attention. That the more Gramsci Gramscian hegemony was established, the more people seemed to be moving in the opposite direction towards capitalism, in a sense. When Marxism became influential across academia, journalism, many professions, and the earth, its materialistic critiques of religion, tradition, the family, etc., did not usher in the revolution. Rather, the Marxist critiques had the only effect of accelerating the disintegration of the culture and facilitating the rise of a new affluent, individualistic, sexually liberated society, which by Marxist standards could only be described as utterly bourgeois. Okay? If you just look at the sexual side, the good old communists were very Puritan. Okay? They, if, you, if you read the history of the, the Communist Party in Italy, you can see that in the 50s, to be a communist, you could not divorce. Okay? To, like Sexual libertinism was a bourgeois perversion. Okay? The, the traditional revolutionaries were extremely puritanical on the sexual side, for example. But, so the funny thing is that the Martian hegemony corresponded to this extremely bourgeois sexual liberalization. What was going on? Del Noce calls the new society, the affluent society or the technological society, or the society of well-being. Many years later, just before he died, Del Noce wrote, Marxist culture, during its revival after the Second World War, produced nihilism. The nihilism of Western society cannot be explained without referring to this repercussion of Marxism. Perhaps Marxist culture was not alone in promoting it, but it had a primary and decisive role in this phenomenon. At the intellectual level, the same period was also marked by a rediscovery of ideas that had first come to prominence during the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century. For example, after World War II, there was a great return to trust in progress based on science and technology, universal but abstract human rights, and like everybody today talks about rights, 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 rights. That started around that time, around the, 40, the 50s, okay? Before the war, it was not the same. Um, an individualistic and worldly idea of happiness, rejections of all form of authority, okay? Anti-authoritarian spirit, these are all ideas from the Enlightenment that had kind of waned, at least in continental Europe during the 19th century. And they really came back after the Second World War at the same time as the rise of Marxism. In fact, this was an enlightenment after Marx. It was just the same like the old French enlightenment. It was a combination of the old enlightenment with Marx because it combined the most scientific, anti-traditional, and irreligious aspects of the enlightenment with the, with the philosophical lessons, lessons of Marxism. To the notion, the typical example of a combination of the enlightenment and Marxism was the sexual revolution. Okay? Often we are tempted to think of the sexual revolution as a pure sociological phenomenon. People changed their habits. They started having more sex. Or, you know, uh, to Del Noce, there was a deep philosophical logic to the sexual revolution. On the one hand, the philosophical premises of the sexual revolution are clearly scientific and positivistic, because from a scientific perspective, sexuality has no teleological or symbolic or meta-empirical value. Right? I mean, uh, sex is just a biological phenomenon. It's nothing to do with uh, anything symbolic, uh, you know, the order of the universe, uh, Christ and the church, you know, can take different religions, different philosophy. Sexuality is always related to some symbolic order, to some structure, to some uh, metaphor. No, from a scientific perspective, perspective sexuality is just a, a brute, natural, biological reality. And there is no order to which human realities have to conform in order to flourish. So, if there is no order, the only goal left is what the Noche calls to expand one's vitality, to feel more alive, right? You want to feel more alive in a strictly individualistic sense, since there are no universal ideas around which people can congregate. 
I want to give you a quote by Del Noche on the sexual revolution. Having accepted the collapse of the metaphysical religious tradition, he's talking about the Europeans of the 50s, okay? European of the 50s says, having accepted the collapse of the metaphysical religious tradition, only science remains standing as mankind's only salvation, symbol of modernity and pillar of the new civilization. He's kind of making fun of the Enlightenment, if you can, if you hear it. But then he goes on and says, but science, at least in its modern sense, studies reality as a system of forces, not of values. It provides instruments, but it does not determine any goals. From the perspective of those who regard science as the only form of knowledge, one can speak of only one goal, incrementing vitality. The sexual revolution is indeed the point of arrival of scientism. Okay? Scientists. The idea that science is the only form of knowledge. At a practical level, one application is the sexual revolution. On the other hand, however, the sexual revolution was also reached with Marxist notions. I'll tell you before, it was, became a combination of the Enlightenment with Marxism. Albay transposed from the economic to the sexual sphere and mixed up with Freudian elements. This is particularly evident, for example, in the works of Wilhelm Reich. I don't know if you've ever heard of Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich was an Austro-Hungarian-American um, psychoanalyst who decided to play, they, they wrote a book called The Sexual Revolution. Okay, his book was called The Sexual Revolution. It's almost unreadable today. And Del Noche calls it the mind come for the sexual revolution because it, it theorized the sexual revolution. Okay, and, uh, and, and Reich, and he, I say, it's horrible to read. And, and, and then uh, Reich had an interest in it. He thought that the only country where the sexual revolution could succeed was America. So he emigrated, okay, he came to America because he thought, well, yeah, there, in, there is a point to that, I think. But anyway, and I'm not going there. But then, and then he came to America, and then he was put in prison because he, he tried to build this machine called the Orgasmotron, which was supposed to convey all the cosmic energy in this box in order to produce the strongest okay, result. And, um, and then he, he was considered a pervert, and so he was put in jail. Okay, and, it, and he died in jail in 1957. Okay? At that time, America was serious about enforcing the kind of thing. But Reich had this idea. Reich took all the Marxist ideas and translated it into sex, okay? into sexual categories. For instance, uh, you know the idea of the, uh, that Marx says that there is going to be this transition to a new world without classes, in which everybody will be at the same level, will be equal. Right, turn this on. There is a transition to a world where everybody will have as much sex as they want. Okay, or well, for instance, Marx has this idea of false consciousness that people believe in God because they are because they are oppressed and because they are oppressed, they create some kind of dream about religion to console themselves. Right, took the same Marxist idea and transposed it in the sexual version, which is people believe in God because they are sexually repressed. If we if we get them sexually free, sexually unrepressed. They will stop believing in God. Isn't that simple? So, uh, Reich was this Marxist translation of, uh, sorry, Reich was this Marxist translation of Marxism, okay? Uh, he theorized the sexual revolution as a Marxist revolutionary transition to a universal state of sexual happiness, made possible by natural science, in which religion would disappear as a form of false consciousness that had been developed to cover up for sexual repression. Now, from a classical Marxist perspective, of course, sexual permissiveness was a form of bourgeois degeneration. Okay, all the old Marxists couldn't ever believe in that. Yet, now, not only Marxists seemed unable to fight the sexual revolution, but in fact, it seemed to have been co-opted by it. Why did this happen? Was it inevitable? Now, in some of his best known books, Del Noche argued that the long-term historical effects of Marxism had to be by necessity, the exact opposite of what Marx expected because of an intrinsic philosophical necessity. Often, people think of Marxism as primarily a political phenomenon associated with communism, which is now remote, both in time and space. It's something that happened in Russia a long time ago. On the contrary, like Lenin, but unlike many Western Marxists, Del Noce considered Marx, first of all, a philosopher, not a political economist. And not just a political philosopher, but a true metaphysician. Although, paradoxically, the upshot of Marx's philosophy is a radical rejection of philosophy itself. The relationship that Del Noce establishes between the philosophical trajectory of Marxism and the rise of Western liberal technocratic secularism is interesting and rather subtle. And I will just give you a quick summary. I hope it's understandable. 
Let me get this sip of water. <clears throat> so, Del Noce identifies the core principle of Marxism and what makes it the starting point of contemporary history in, quote, the rejection of every form of dependence, end of quote. As Marx wrote, uh, wrote in the manuscripts of 1844, quote, a being considers himself independent when he stands on his own feet, and he only stands on his own feet when he owes his existence to himself. Okay, so the, the starting point of Marxian philosophy is that I make myself, okay, the self-made man. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the idea that you are not free if somebody else creates you. Okay, the very idea of God has to be eliminated, not because we conclude that God does not exist. God must not exist, must not exist, because if God creates me, I'm not independent, okay? Marxian atheism is not the conclusion of an investigation, but a sort of moral postulate. The postulate that the entire history of the world, quote, by the Noce, is the self-creation of man through labor. By my work, I create myself. Have you ever thought of that idea? I create myself by working. An immediate consequence of this postulate from the manuscripts of 1844 is what Del Noce calls an atheologization of reason. Reason becomes atheistic, not, not religion becomes atheistic, but rationality. Rationality becomes atheistic in the following sense, that human reason no longer participates in the universal logos of the Platonic and Christian tradition. Okay? In, the, in the Christian and Platonic tradition, human reason was participatory. You are rational by participating in a universal logos. In, on the contrary, from the Marxist perspective, reason is strictly an instrument of social self-creation. Okay? Reason is what we use to create ourselves by work. It's a purely technical, instrumental rationality. Thought is praxis, and politics is the true philosophy. Right? Politics, the way I transform the, I transform the world politically, is the true form of philosophy. Accordingly, the true meaning of Marxist historical materialism is not a generic priority of the economic factors or the cultural factors, rather it's the radical affirmation that thought does not reveal any truth. Thought coincides with human activity to transform and possess reality. To think is to possess and to transform. It's a deeply technical idea of reason if you think of it. This shift accounts for the negative power of Marxism, which systematically denounces the arguments of its opponent as mere social constructs, which are devoid of any intrinsic truth value. You tell me something, it's a social construct. Okay, I don't, I don't have to listen to you. Okay, it's a, it's a social construct. Let's change the social construct. Ah, okay, and then my truth will be the truth and yours will no longer be the truth. Okay, therefore, your, your arguments are destined to die, to disappear together with the social circumstances that produced your argument, and to be replaced by the new values produced by the revolutionary praxis. Okay? I'm going to do a nice revolution and my arguments will become true. Okay? We make the truth. We don't know the truth. We make the truth. Is that clear? That's, that's, that's to, 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 to Del Noce, that's the essence of Marxism. Now, Del Noce points out that taken in isolation, this idea, which is called historical materialism, have you heard of that? The idea of historical materialism is tantamount to total relativism. Okay? The notion realize that if you take this idea by itself, in, in Marx there is something else, but if you take it by itself, historical materialism is tantamount to total relativism. Since all truth is measured by human self-creative practice, and therefore all truth becomes political, right? All truth becomes political because I make the truth and politically. This is why Marxist revolutionary doctrine needs to combine historical materialism with the second, which is a negative part, with the second positive element, which in Marxist theory has traditionally been called dialectic materialism. In the simplest term, the way I like to call it is that is faith in the direction of history. Okay, there is historical materialism, but there is also a direction of history. Supposedly, history is moving by its own internal dialectic process towards a radical transformation, a revolution, which will inaugurate a radically new world, the reign of freedom, the classless society. Okay, so you have to combine these two things. A negative, a negative element to demolish my enemy's argument. Historical materialism is the negative part. I demolish your argument. And then what do I have to offer in the positive way? In the positive sense, I have to offer this thing. Look, history is going toward fulfillment, the revolution. We are going to eliminate poverty and races. All the bad things are going to disappear, okay? 
the Noche calls this faith in the direction of history the religious aspect of Marxism. Of course, it's not a Christian, but rather a Gnostic type of religiosity, inasmuch as it is both atheistic and dualistic. The revolution will supposedly mark a transition from one, quote, from one stage of mankind to another, from a world in which we are strangers to a totally new world to come. Therefore, a true Marxist revolutionary, quote, by the notion, denies all rights to present humanity in order to transfer the fullness of rights to a future humanity. Okay? The present humanity can be kind of crushed because we are going to replace it with a new humanity. This religious aspect of Marxism is why ultimately all violence is justified for the sake of the revolution. In Del Noche's view, the combination of these two heterogeneous elements, on one hand, the corrosive power of historical materialism, and on the other hand, the religious power of the faith in the direction of history, is what made Marxism so successful. As he says, quote, Marxism is modern philosophy in the aspect in which it presents itself as secular, separating from religion, which makes itself a religion. Okay? Uh, Marxism is the point in which in this faith in the direction of history uh, becomes a secular religion. However, that same combination of those two negative and positive elements also makes Marxism very unstable. Okay? So this was Del Noche's big idea, that Marxism is the question of these two things that kind of don't go well together. Okay? The negative aspect is that everything is relative because of historical materialism. The positive aspect is that everything is going to end well because there is the direction of history. But these two things don't fit well together. They are actually contradictory. And as a result, Marxism must undergo a process of decomposition. Okay? So Marxism is like the combination of two truths. It's like water and oil, right? Water and oil, if you, you know, if you mix them up violently enough, they can hold together for a while. But in the long, in the long term, the water and the oil will separate. Okay? So uh, Marx calls this process of the composition of Marxists. In the decomposition of Marxists, the materialistic and the dialectic aspect will turn on each other. Typically, the materialistic and relativistic aspect will prevail and will devour the dialectic revolutionary aspect. After all, why should the materialistic critique not apply to revolutionary thought itself? If all ideas are measured by their practical and political success, why should the same criterion of success not apply to Marx's ideas also? Right? Apply to yourself, right, Mr. Marx, right? If, if, if everything is a, a, this a historical materialist, you too are a product of your age, right? And you too are a result of material causes. So at the end of the day, these two things will split and the materialist aspect will prevail. To the notion, this decomposition of Marxism is the, expo is the explanation of what I described before, right? While the, the Gramscian hegemony did not lead to the revolution, it led to a more harsh capitalism in some sense. Ultimately, the non-Marxist world would have to turn the philosophical weapons of Marxism against Marxism itself, but in doing so, it would be transformed. Whereas the European bourgeoisie of the liberal age, from 1870 to 1914, generally embraced the formerly Christian morality, which was called Kantian ethics, you know, Kant, the great German philosopher, is a sort of Christian ethics in its values, but the Christian ethics based on pure reason, but it's still formally Christian. The expansion of Marxism after the Russian Revolution and the two world wars was the occasion for the final collapse of the Kantian compromise, okay? So in a sense, Marxists wiped away the Christian remnants of the bourgeois worldview, which is completely paradoxical, right? Instead of bringing about the, the, downs, the fall of the bourgeois worldview, the Noche accuses Marxists of eliminating the last elements that prevented the bourgeois worldview from triumphing. I'm going to give you a quote. Quote, the technological society by, by the Noche is the only possible bourgeois and secular answer to Marxism. And it arises because of an intrinsic contradiction within Marxism itself. Therefore, the technological civilization defeats Marxism in the sense that it appropriates all its negation of transcendent values. It accepts from Marxism the negative part by pushing to the limit the very source of negation, namely the aspect of Marxism that makes it a form of absolute relativism. relativism. This as the result of turning Marxism upside down into an absolute individualism which serves the purpose of giving the technological civilization the false appearance of being a democracy and the continuation of the spirit of liberalism. So, the Noche, this is open to discussion, the Noche was even convinced that the post-Marxist society is a false liberalism. The end result 
will be an extreme for, now it's back to me, <laughs> sorry, that was the notion, end of quote. The end result will be an extreme form of secularism in which all transcendent truths and values will have been undermined by the Marxist critique, but without being replaced. The outcome will be a society, the Notch wrote in 1963, in which each subject perceives the other as alienus, Latin for a foreigner, separated, not joined to me by a shared value, so that alienation, the great Marxist category, will be actually pushed to the highest degree. This post-Marxist society will be more bourgeois than classical liberal societies because it will have incorporated the Marxist critique of religion and ethics and used them to deny the very possibility of another world, including the Marxist other world after the revolution. Let me read another passage from the same essay from 1963. Del Noce says, the implicit philosophy in the society of well-being, meaning the affluent society, is the radical development of one aspect of Marxism, the one that makes it a form of absolute relativism as a consequence of historical materialism. This development is so rigorous that in the end it eliminates Marx's other aspect, that of being a form of dialectical thought and a revolutionary doctrine. Okay? So the materialist aspect kills the revolutionary aspect. In short, it marks the victory of positivism and sociologism over Marxism. The victory of a form of positivism, like you know, Auguste Comte, the great French philosopher of the 19th century was a positivist, a form of positivism that has shed the romantic aspects that characterize its 19th century version. Because Comte was still a romantic. He thought there would be a new Middle Ages, that he would be the Pope, you know, all that stuff. He did. Um, but in this way, the new society has reached a form of impiety greater than Marxism. Because Marxism, even if it is rigorously atheistic and denies every revelation and every supernatural reality, in its communist version is actually a religion in which the future replaces the eternal, and totality replaces the absolute and the city of God. So he said, Marxists still had this religious aspect. Right? What the religious aspect of Marxism was the faith in the future, in the direction of history. On the contrary, the society of well-being is the only one in world history that does not originate from a religion, but arises essentially against the religion, even though paradoxically, the religion is Marxist. Okay? So there is this paradox that the most secular culture we have is a reaction to a religion, Marxist, which is actually not a religion. Okay? This, this is Del Noce's idea. Del Noce calls this unintended and wholly contradictory outcome of revolutionary thought a heterogenesis of end, which is kind of a complicated way to say something that gets the opposite result of what you intend. Marxist was not simply defeated. It would be easy to say that Marxist lost. According to the Noce, Marxists won, but half of it, right? Half of Marxists won and half of Marxists lost, okay? And so he said, Mar the contradictions of Marxists forced it to decompose, meaning that it lost and won at the same time. It lost as a revolutionary movement because it won as radical atheism and relativism, okay? So you see, if you have a system of ideas in which you combine two different aspects, it's possible that one aspect wins and the other loses, okay? So in the case of Marxism, he says, the idea of the revolution lost, but the idea of radical atheism and relativism won. In the title of one of his most famous books, speaking specifically of, of Gramsci again, Del Noce described the idea to create a Western form of Marxism as the suicide of the revolution, because Gramsci intended to challenge liberal capitalism by infusing Western culture with Marxist ideas, but by doing so, he actually helped the purification of the bourgeois spirit from all residues of religiosity and non-instrumental values. Okay? So the idea of the suicide revolution is that the revolution trying to destroy the enemy destroys itself. Now I'm going to shift gear and talk about a little more generally about uh, political philosophy. What time is it, if I may ask? 4.24. We have to end by? Let me do five more minutes. All right, one more second. While Del Noce wrote mostly about the Italian case, he actually regarded the role of Marxism in the European process of secularization as representative of a general pattern that can be repeated in other contexts and under different names. The pattern to him is the following. On the one hand, classical liberalism cannot resist the critique of revolutionary progressivism. But on the other hand, Revolutionary progressivism always undergoes the heterogeneity of ends, the suicide of the revolution, 
and opens the way to more radical forms of liberalism and ultimately to nihilism. Okay, so this, the, the, the notion is this double two-stage process in which, uh, in which liberal, classical liberalism ultimately cannot resist the critique of revolutionary thought, but revolutionary thought self-destructs and creates a more radical form of liberalism. Okay? I'm going to skip some because we are running out of time. I want to read some beautiful pieces that I think will be my last piece. Okay, basically what, what the notion claims is that the, the crucial opposition is not between liberalism and anti-liberalism, between conservatives or progressives. In his opinion, political doctrines must first of all be divided into two classes, perfectist and anti-perfectist. In English, you tend to say perfectionist and anti-perfectionist, I believe, but I use perfectist for some reasons I'm not going to explain because there's another time. What does perfectism mean? Perfectism means the belief that there is no limit to the goodness we can reach by our own strength in the world, right? That there is no original sin, okay? Anti-perfectist, in a sense, believes that there is a limitation. Now, Del Noce explains this opposition of perfectism and anti-perfectism by quoting a French philosopher, Renouvier, who thought that in political science there are two postulates, the postulate of progress and the postulate of sin. And now here is the notch explanation of these two things, the postulate of progress and the postulate of sin. We can distinguish one conception that sees human reality as really or absolutely transformable with respect to what concerns moral good and evil. We can change. We can generally call it the conception of the Enlightenment, since it is characterized by the extension of the idea of progress to the world of history. We can identify another conception, which in the contrary is characterized by the postulate of sin. Progress is limited to the scientific and technical field. You have progress in science, you have progress in, in technology, but you don't have necessarily have progress in society. At every time in history, this, there is the same possibility for evil. The possibility for evil is the same. Any age has the same possibility for evil. And the task of the politician is to minimize it without claiming, however, to be able to destroy it at its root. Now, the first conception, the, the one that believes in the posture of progress, quote, is characterized by the idea of the direction of history and of the salvation of the individual achieved by participating in it. History has a direction because it is meaningfully oriented in such a way that the reality of evil shrinks more and more where the shrinking can be viewed as a necessity or as a possibility tied to our own human will. So the interpreter of the postulate of progress, of the direction of history, is the politician, the state, the party, which has not only the right, but the duty to strike the individuals to oppose it. Because by doing so, it executes against them the verdict that history has pronounced. Hence, it has a dominative conception of power. Now let me explain the other side and I will wrap up. Conversely, in a politics that obeys the posture of sin, the struggle against evil and the realization of a relative degree of perfection is the task of the individual. And thus it is a struggle that can indeed minimize evil, which is beatable in that precise moment, at that precise point, but cannot extinguish evil at the root. And the politician's ministerial, not dominative task, is to establish the best conditions to facilitate this struggle. Thus, the non-perfectist conception of a, is actually based on presupposition of a metaphysical nature, the absoluteness and transcendence of the truth. I would even add that this ultimate presupposition is a generically Christian political theology, accepting that there is a reality higher than man, accepting the fall. Any state inspired by it will flourish only when religiosity in a, in a transcendent sense is alive in the culture and in popular awareness. Okay, so just to wrap up, Del Noce identified these two possibilities, a perfectist policy, policy, politics or anti-perfectist politics, and he believed that a perfectist politics is destined to go through the pattern, no? Because to him, liberalism was perfectist, right? For him, invisible hand liberalism is perfectist, because it assumed that there is this perfect mechanism by which the invisible hand, you know, gets the best outcome. And Marxism was perfectist, okay? So you have these two perfectist possibilities classical liberalism and Marxism, and they have this dance, they dance together towards nihilism, right? Because once again, uh, classical liberalism can be, is criticized correctly by Marxists, and Marxism fails to overcome it. Okay, I think I will stop here. Is that okay? <laughs>
All right, uh, we have a bit of time for, uh, for some questions. And in the Constitutional Studies program, we have a tradition of uh, encouraging our students um, to ask the first question or two. We have any, any of our undergraduates in particular would like to ask a question? Why don't you uh, tell us your name? And Hi there. Hey, my name is John Hale, and I'm a sophomore here at the university. Uh, my question is for you is, did any of these Marxist thinkers attempt to explain the origin of man, or were they only concerned with contemporary issues directly pertinent to life in the proletariat? Well, is there any experts on Marx in the room? I mean, I, I would think that Marx is, uh, was kind of happy with kind of a you know, materialistic enlightenment uh, explanation. Right? Um, I mean, this was before Darwin, you know, so I mean. Right, exactly. Because uh, you talked about like a radical atheism and kind of kind of a rejection of of the predominant pre-modern thought of Christianity and, and or any of the Abrahamic faiths. So I was just wondering if they attempted to describe or or, or even address. Because you, you okay, also the, said. The, 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 Yes. Right. How does, how does a human being that doesn't make Exactly. It for yes, but you see, that's an, ex that's an excellent question. But you see, exactly. Marx is, is so deep in his negation that he even refuses to ask questions of fact. Okay, what, what you're asking is a question of truth, right? You're asking a question about the truth. Did it happen this way? Did it happen that way? If you, if you are a completely rigorous Marxist, I think that you, would, you refuse to ask that kind of question because we produce the truth socially. Every truth is produced socially through our work and through our ideas which we use as instruments. If you push seriously to the extreme this notion of self-creation, this notion that reason is a pure instrument. Reason is not about knowledge. Okay? Reason is not about revealing the truth, even the truth of human origins. If you take seriously this idea that reason is purely instrumental, the question is not asked. So I, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody here is a Marxist expert, but my guess as an amateur is that Marx would refuse to ask the question. Thank you. Graduate students. Uh, my name is John, uh, early Christian studies. Um, I was wondering um, if Del Noche had any ideas on how long he thought this sort of um, I guess we'll call it a tra transmogrified sort of bourgeois form of half of, of Marxism. How long did he think that could last on its own on this sort of fumes? Um, and could it, could it do so indefinitely? Um, and, and if so, would it further transform into um, something maybe even entirely different? Um, I mean... <clears throat> It's a difficult question. I mean, and, and I, I know that if you read his works, there is a period during the 70s in which he was extremely pessimistic. Okay? He became very pessimistic because, you know, in his view, there, is, there cannot be any society if we don't share some common ideal, right? If there is no some kind of uh, common story, common narrative. If, uh, now, this position that you just mentioned is extremely individualistic, right? I mean, it's like, it's like we are these atoms. We are these uh, human atoms who in, engage in transactions, including sexual transactions. But really, everything is measured by scientific knowledge in the most narrow and limiting sense of what can be measured, what can be used, what can be produced. So uh, at, that, in, at that level, what you would expect just by logical extrapolation would be a gradual loosening of uh, social bonds, right? I mean, he used the formula non-society, non-hyphen society, to indicate a society in which people don't have anything in common at a deeper level. So it's like, a, instead of being a liquid, it's a gas, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just a, a, now, having said that, Del Noje was convinced that there is no, it was, there is no determinant in history, so history can always change direction. But he think that if you follow that direction to the logical conclusion, he saw cultural disintegration that we don't have to follow it to that conclusion by, all, by any means, right? But, but he, thinks, he thinks that that was a bad direction, yes. Uh, 
she was very interested in uh, health sector. My name's still Rob, and I'm still a graduate student in the... Nice to meet you. Something. And <laughs> I think I'm still a grad. You know. And I know Del Noche is very interested in Simone Weil's uh, political thought, mm. and we don't always think about Simone Weil as a, a political thinker, so mm. I was hoping you might be able to uh, help us think that way. Well, I gave a talk on that. So if you, if you Google my name and Simone Weil, you may find my talk. But anyway, the, if you want. Anyway, yeah, you're right. That's a very good point. No, Del Noche thought that Simone Weil was the example of how to come out of the trap that he was asking about, right? Why? Because, you know, Simon Weil took very seriously the revolutionary position, right? Simon Weil went to work in a factory, and she, for a while she was interested in Marxism, and it rejected it entirely. But, but, but she went to the depth of the social problem, the social justice problem, right? The thing is that about Simon Weil, that she was so radical, that by going to the depth of the social justice problem, she rediscovered the supernatural, she called it, right? The surnatural. But what is the surnatural? The supernatural in Simon Weil is the recognition that there is another dimension, right? That, the, that what, what Marx denies, that what Marx denies that we don't make ourselves, right? I mean, that, 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 that in fact, we are in an intrinsic sense open to another, right? Open to to another world, to another reality, the supernatural, right? And that we are never happy in a sense, right? And so the Marxist promise was actually mendacious. But what I want to stress is that uh, Simone Weil did not discover this, the religious dimension again because she was religious to begin with. She was very secular, right? She was a disciple of Alain, the famous French secular philosopher. She was extremely secular. So she did not, uh, did not just a beautiful sentence, he says, um, uh, he says that Simone Weil rediscovered traditional ideas not out of traditionalism, but out of a revolt. Okay? She did not dis rediscover the traditional ideas out of traditionalism, but out of a revolt. This is a profound concept because you know, there are still people who are traditionalists, which are attached to traditional ideas. God bless them. But she, didn't, she was not in that position. She was a typical secular person. We, she was, her family was a very secular Jewish family. And uh, she rediscovered the old religious question, not traditionally, but going to the depth of the social justice question. Okay? And, so, and so the notion thing that that's the necessary trajectory for a social, sorry, for a secular person today. A secular person today can rediscover the Platonic Christian tradition by taking the crisis seriously in a moral sense, and going to the depth of it. Right? That's, that's basically why he thinks that he, she's paradigmatic of kind of an escape from this uh, tailspin of modernity. Um, I'm, I was struck listening to you um, talking about the two sides of Marx that that are fundamentally unstable, that one has to give way. And what strikes me about that formulation is, you know, here at, here at Notre Dame, we have a distinguished, distinguished emeritus professor of philosophy named Alistair McIntyre. And it seems to me that one of McIntyre's projects is, in, in some ways, to argue that by perhaps re-wedding Christianity and some aspects of Marxism, the aspect of Marxism that I think you regard or that Del Noche regards as having been rejected, mm -hmm. Uh, in this way, it might be possible to fight against the, the hedonist, materialist, uh, uh, relativist world uh, that this different alignment has created. I know. So the, the question that comes to my mind is, uh, what in Del Noche, what in his thinking led him, or is it the case that he, that he concluded that the Dis, the dissolution of Marxism, the, the degradation of Marxism, had to go in one direction. Yeah. Uh, in other words, the transcendent would always be the unstable part that would be left out. Yes. And if it's not the case, is that part available for a kind of reconciliation with this Christian Platonic understanding, I think in the way that perhaps McIntyre would argue that it is? All right. Well, that's a wonderful question. I would pay some real money to have the Noche and McIntyre in the same room and have a conversation. <laughs> but. But the Noche, no, the Noche is dead. Yes. I, 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 can, I, can, I can try my best to channel the Noche, but I'm not going to debate McIntyre. So. <laughs> yeah, there, and now, there are two answers to that, okay? Uh, 
The first thing is that Del Noche does think that Marxism had a positive role. In, 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 in Del Noche, it's the part I skipped. At the very end, I was going to explain that Del Noche advocates what I would call a form of non-perfectist liberalism. Okay? Now, we should explain what non-perfectist liberalism means. But he thinks that the only way to achieve non-perfectist liberalism is that Marxists must attack and destroy perfectist liberalism. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he says that, that Marxism is the dialectical reagent, like in a chemical sense, you know, a reagent, is that the pronunciation, a reagent, you know, a chemical reagent that attacks classical liberalism and brings into crisis. Now, left to its own devices, this brings about the crisis of modernity because re Marxism itself fails, and so then you go into nihilism. But what, what the notion proposes is that in this destruction of classical liberalism, Marxism plays a positive role. Except that way to overcome this spiral of liberalism and revolutionary thought is to drop perfectism and to introduce a form of non-perfectist liberalism. Okay, so this is, this is the positive value of Marx. That's the first answer to your question. There is a second answer. The second answer is that there is somebody who tried to do that. And that was Giovanni Gentile. Okay? Giovanni Gentile was a famous Italian philosopher at, at the beginning of the 20th century who tried to do exactly that. He tried to get rid of the materialistic aspect of Marxism and to keep a purely dialectic Marxism. And then he became the official philosopher of Mussolini. Del Noce has written a beautiful book on Gentile, which I never read from cover to cover. I can come back next year and tell you why, but uh, the, I'm joking. But the, the, apparently, Del Noce thinks that that's possible, but it can also have bad consequences. And that's all I know, so I probably shouldn't go any further. Hi, I'm Matt, uh, also a PhD student here. Um, uh, piggybacking off of Professor Denine's question, can you speak maybe also about Donald Che's relationship to uh, the Frankfurt School and yeah, the more you know, that's very interesting. Marxism? Yeah, that's very interesting you know, because in, in, in this country often the, the Frankfurt School is thought to be very either bad or very good. Uh, to Del Noche, the, the Frankfurt School also went the process of the composition of a different type. And uh, um, Del Noce thought that there is one side which is the Marcuse side, and there is the Horkheimer side. To him, Marcuse repeats again the cycle of the composition of Marxism. Okay? For him, Marcuse tries to attack uh, the, the affluent society, to criticize the affluent society, and then he proposes this kind of uh, uh, freedom of the instincts, right? The freedom of uh, uh, spontan spontaneousness, you know, whatever, or, uh, which boils down to sexual, li sexual liberation, if you kind of uh, interpret it in a simplistic way. And then at the end of the day, 1968 brought another cycle of even more liberalism. Right? After, <laughs> in this country after 1968, then you had Reagan. I mean, in, in, so to, to him, Marcuse goes through the same cycle as Marx. He's just more on the sexual side than on the economic side. However, Del Noce was a big fan of Orkheimer, because Orkheimer was a bit like Simone Weil. Okay? Orkheimer, like Simone Weil, went to the depth of trying to understand the crisis of neo-capitalism, of the affluent society, of the technological society, and guess what? At the end of his life, he came to very religious positions, right? I mean, the, uh, these books don't get translated into English for some reason, but the last book by your Keimer is, is a beautiful interview called The Nostalgia for the Totally Other, right? The Nostalgia for the Totally Other is, is the other outcome of the Frankfurt School. You read German, Italian, French? It's been translated in every language but English. Okay. And so, yeah, that's, all, that's all I know. Does it answer the question? I mean, I, th I think they would say that the Frankfurt School was an interesting experience that went in two different directions. If you read in the book with the black cover called The Crisis of Modernity, there is a long essay on, uh, called Authority Versus Power, which is very long, but about halfway through, there is five or six pages in which he describes in depth his thinking about the Frankfurt School. Hi, Connor, um, also a PhD student here. Hi. Um, so I'm curious, uh, some would say, you know, these latter-day Marxists, you mentioned Gramsci, and now we've had the Frankfurt School sort of 
uh, did reach American shores, but some would say that they kind of are immediately assimilated and vulgarized into the sort of regnant liberalism yes. in this country. So I wonder if you would comment on um, how Del Noche viewed the American case uh, vis-a-vis okay. the Italian and European cases. Yes, that's an excellent question that everybody asks, and every time I try to answer the best I can. Okay, it's a difficult question. I think there is, a, there is, a, there is a, again, two or three possible answers. Okay, the, the, certainly Del Noce looks at these things from a European perspective, more than that, a continental European perspective. You are completely right, there is no question about that. Does it apply to the US situation? Yes, I think it does, but with some qualifications. Um, you have to realize that there is a logic to ideas. So people can come to the same conclusions independently, right? If you start from the same presupposition, you don't need to read Marx. You can come to the same conclusion. Um, so I would say, first of all, that there was a Marxist influence in American culture, but it was not through political Marxism, right? In, in, in Europe, the Marxist influence came through communism and socialism, through, through political form. In the United States, for all I know, but I'm no expert, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Marxists played a major role in shaping the social sciences, right? I mean, you know, af after the war um, in this country, there was a big explosion of uh, psychology, anthropology, sociology. The social sciences often operated under Marxist presupposition, and they had impact, okay? They had impact on the culture. That's the first thing I would say. Um, also psychoanalysis. Okay, for instance, uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, I said before that Wilhelm Reich decided to come to America because he had this feeling that America was the right place to start a sexual revolution. Uh, I think that this intuition was that uh, American culture was at that point more naturally scientific, sociologistic, and pragmatistic than European culture, right? So it was more inclined to kind of put together the question of truth, the question of the Platonic and Christian universal rationality, and to embrace utilitarianism also in a Marxist sense, in the sense of that reason is instrumental. Okay? If, if, you, if you take as the, as the core of Marxism this instrumentalization of rationality, that rationality is purely instrumental and also applied to the human factor, you see that by nature, modern sociology and modern uh, psychology and modern etc. are kind of naturally Marxist projects, right? Because, because of the nature of rationality that they advance, even if maybe they don't intend to be Marxist, but by the, because of the type of rationality, the type of idea of reason that they operate under, they have a natural bent toward Marxist, right? So if you want me to scandalize you, I'll tell you that you know, like, like people in the, in the Middle Ages said that uh, some of the great pagan sages were naturaliter Christiani, like Dante says that Virgil was like a natural Christian. I would say that even if they didn't know Marx, some of the human science, the, the American human scientists and some aspects of human, of American culture at the early 50s were naturaliter Marxisti, okay? Uh, if you want to read a book on that, there is a, a beautiful book by um, George Marston. There is a book called The Twilight of the American Enlightenment, which is a very nice book, which Marston looks at the co American culture in the early 50s and argues that there was this idealization of science, of social engineering, that they were not Marxist in a political sense. But Mar Del Noche is not looking at Marxist as a political scientist. He's looking at Marxist as a, as a philosopher. So philosophically, these ideas were there. Some of them may not be coming from Marxism, but they were very compatible with Marxism. Uh, speaking of, uh, Del Noche don't, doesn't talk about America much. Well, one side com Del Noche is great for the side comments. Times makes these side comments that somebody should write a book about it, but nobody ever did. Anyway, Del Noche says, in some footnote somewhere, that the only way that this new culture could triumph in America was by separating American pragmatist tradition from its spiritualist aspect. Now, you explain it to me. But I mean, but, but what I think is say that the American <coughs> pragmatist tradition in James and Pierce and all those guys that you know better than I, John Dewey, had a spiritualist tradition combined with a pragmatist element. And Del Noche kind of speculates that if you remove the spiritualist aspect from the pragmatist American culture, you are very close to Marx to begin with. That's my guess, but I'm no expert. So. Wow. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for this really mind-bending uh, lecture. And uh, for my graduate students, uh, we'll continue, um, let's say, about 10 past uh, the hour. Um, uh, for the rest of you, want to join me in thanking uh, Professor Lenz. Thank you.